Great, thanks. Um, what I'm going to do, I'll run through a bit of history behind the project, and uh, then we can chat about how I'm going to do the actual release. And hopefully some of the folks on here will be able to um, contribute as well if you want to write your own projects. Um, so I guess most of the people will know me from the Open Scene Project, which Don Burns started back in 98. And I started contributing with him because it was a, he wanted to develop a hang on simulator. And he needed somebody with some flight model experience. I used to do aerodynamics in a previous life. Um, so I started helping with him with that. And then the Open Signal project kind of fell out of that simulation project that we started working on together. Um, fast forward to 2016, and the Kronos Group released uh, Vulcan. So there was this discussion within the Open Signal community how do we you know, adopt that in going forwards? And I thought about it most deeply, where do you port the Vulcan SIGGRAPH to the, sorry, the Open SIGGRAPH to Vulcan, and or to go the separate route of actually get a new project. And my real motivation for going for a separate project was the observation that with the Open SIGGRAPH, so half the actual time in a frame might be taken up by the CPU overhead of the Open SIGGRAPH itself, and then half with the um, open gel, which is also quite CPU heavy. And if we were to kind of make the um, open gel side replace it with Vulcan, and that say gets five times faster because of much lower CPU overhead, we'll only actually see uh, you know a performance improvement by you know seventy percent. Um, we wouldn't get a, a doubling in performance, even you know despite something you know, the API being five times faster you're not going to get that performance improvement. The only way to get that much better is to address the CPU overhead that the open sync graph had. And the design of the open sync graph has really kind of evolved over 20 years and it's come, come quite heavy. And there was no real way to actually make it much faster because to remove all the kind of, um, the kind of extra overhead that the open sync graph has, requires a, a very different model for the actual um, computer to the kind of memory model you need to work with is, is very different. Um, I'm just going to add some more people um, to the list. So hi, Aaron Reiner. Um, I'm not expert at these things. You know, I'm a program, I'm not a, <laughs> a Zoom person. Right. Um, so it came obvious to me that the only real way to get the performance we wanted from the Open Synchronous Project, sorry, from a new project, would be to start from scratch and from first principles, work out exactly what is what is required from the Synchronous and to kind of minimize those overheads as much as possible. So, you know, Vulcan's getting much, much faster than OpenGL because of the much lower CPU overhead. We need to actually match that on the Open the Vulcan Syngraf side to get the same level of performance improvements. And that really basically required a new project. And by the advent of C17, it also became kind of obvious that we need to address kind of updating of um, the use of C++ uh, because OpenGL, Open Syngraf has really kind of still struggling along with um, ancient C++ for backwards compatibility for old visual simulators and stuff like that. And it's such a big code base, updating it is difficult as well. So when we came up with the Vulcan Singer project, um, that basically came about in May uh, 2018. I was approached by a business, business sim company that had seen my discussions on the OSG users mailing list uh, about wanting to create a new SYNGRAF and that the open SYNGRAF really wouldn't you know, work well just porting it to Vulcan. Um, wouldn't get all the benefits of Vulcan. And they basically liked that idea. So they funded me and uh, also Thomas Hogarth joined me. And we were basically funded for a first year and a half of the Vulcan Singular project. So that basically takes us from May 2018 through to, um, we're getting to kind of late 2019. And I'll chat about a couple of things that we went through through that. Um, I'll go to the next application. Um, 
So this is the first application that I got running. And if people, if anybody's written, um, started Learn Vulcan, one of the first things you look at is the Vulcan tutorial. And I basically took that code base and learned about Vulcan using that and started experimenting with it. And the actual project is not very clean C++. So it's kind of C embedded in a C++ application and it's not very clean and not anyway a, a starting place for a scene graph. So it was a case of, okay, learn a bit about Vulkan. And then I started experimenting with the different components. And I basically created the VSG draw example you shall find in VSG examples as a test bed. And I built the scene graph up bit by bit. So what started off as 1500 lines of code um, with the Vulkan tutorial, um, just able to basically do two textured quads and that's it. You know, it's like 1,500 kinds of code in Vulcan to do texture triangles, which is just crazy. You can do much less work with OpenGL and get that result. So it was really a job for me then to basically evolve the scene graph, to kind of build it out class by class, um, to be able to actually reduce the amount of code required in the VSD draw example. And eventually slimmed down to, I think it's a couple hundred lines of code. So it's about um, one seventh of the size of the Vulcan tutorial, which kind of raw open GL, so raw Vulcan down to at the scene graph. And actually, if you look at VSG draw now, it's even quite crude compared to what you can do with the Vulcan scene graph these days. You know, drawing two quads, you can use the builder, VSG builder class and you can do it in a couple of lines of code. So as the products marched on, we've gone from kind of raw Vulcan down into kind of distilled Vulcan with a C++ wrapper on it, which is appropriate for a scene graph. Um, one of the questions early on was, do we use uh, the Vulcan C++ headers? And they're about 50, 60,000 lines of code and huge. They didn't have a memory model in it. And the kind of class design with it is, not quite Vulcan, it's kind of, it's just, it just seems really clunky. So, you know, you have Vulcan and you have Vulcan API on it, then in theory, another scene graph on top of that, and then you have your application on it. So what I didn't want is to have too many layers between the application and the Vulcan layer at the bottom. So what I chose with the Vulcan scene graph is to basically directly use the Vulcan C API. And then choose the actual kind of naming or the classes and all the members to kind of one to one correlate with the actual Vulkan API. Um, it's done with a scene graph in mind, so it's not one to one in terms of usage, but in terms of naming and the methods and the actual property values, um, they're all consistent with Vulkan. And that's something people have no open scene graph, they'll know that I chose to do that very deliberately with the open scene graph. So the open scene graph is an open GL scene graph and um, Vulcan, quite clearly as the name says, is a Vulcan scene graph. It doesn't pretend to be an abstraction from maybe the other APIs. It's about distilling down Vulcan so it could be used in a scene graph and then building layers on top of it. So things like the mass libraries, uh, memory management, and then the traverses through the scene graph and the various different utilities on it, event handling, viewers, and eventually we're kind of building it out to create a Vulkan SDK that you can quite rapidly create a graphics application on. And one of the main things I'm trying to go for is to try and simplify using Vulkan for people because nobody wants to write 15 lines ago just to do two texture triangles. That's just crazy. You know, we've all got too little time to work. So it's really kind of trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, and we may have not got there yet, but we keep on striving for it. And I certainly feel with 1.0, it's actually now pretty darn good in terms of you know where we came from to where we are. And it's still a case of improving on it. You know, once we get to 1.0, that's not the road stopped. We're going to continue marching on. Um the I'll, I'll go through and I can have a couple of examples um, of what's actually moved on to. Um, so once I've got the kind of basic um, 
rendering done, then it was a case of actually, okay, let's start loading 3D models. And what one of the things that Thomas Hogarth did with me, I commissioned him to write an OSG to VSG loader. And this is one of the first models we loaded. So it's not lit, it's just triangles and colored. Um, but this is a, an open scene graph data set. So that was another milestone. So this is kind of fast forwarding to 2019. And then we started building out more and more functionality in the Vulcan scene graph and also the actual water. So everyone should actually recognize this if they're an open scene graph user. This is the landing zone at the bottom, bottom of Ed Levin Park in California. Now this is quite near to Don Burns local site. And this is actually the model he created for his flight simulator. Um, so this is now rendered in the Vulcan scene graph. And um, so we're kind of, we're implementing things like trees, uh, with the billboarding and things like that. It's all very basic functionality, but slowly building out the Vulcan scene graph um, to match some of the features that the open scene graph has. Um, because it's quite a good benchmark. You know, it's a mature you know, industry proven scene graph. If you can start chasing those functionality down, then we know that we're going to end up roughly in the right place that we need it to be. And as we started actually implementing more and more of the BSG and uh, the open scene graph, we can actually load more models. Now, this is a, an Umeå City open flight model from Umeå in northern Sweden. And I actually, early on in the Open Scene Graph project, I, I went to work with them up in Umeå. And this was covered in snow when I was down there. Um, in terms of the Vulcan Scene Graph project, I use this model for performance testing. And we're able to quite quickly get the Vulcan Scene Graph working five times faster on this data set than the Open Scene Graph is able to work. Um, and it's on the same hardware. So the difference is that the open scene graph combination with OpenGL has such a high CPU overhead, it doesn't matter how fast your graphics is, you're going to be CPU limited. But with the Vulcan scene graph, I've taken a lot of effort to keep the, the objects very small, uh, remove as many decision you know, if statements um, within the actual traversal to avoid stalling the CPU. And by really taking care of that, the actual cold traversals uh, well, and general traversals can be up to 10 times faster than the open scene graph to doing the same thing. Um, so it's quite possible to actually make significant performance gains without having to worry about threading, just blitz the data at the scene graph and then send it down to the graphics hardware. And I, you know, at this stage of the project, like 2019, you know, I'd make a modification and then optimize things on the Vulcan scene graph side to optimize the data representation in Vulcan and on the CPU side. And I was just getting more and more performance. I couldn't seem to hit the top, you know, the bottlenecks on the actual graphics hardware. Um, it's just, you know, there seemed to be so much capacity in modern hardware that the open scene graph just wasn't utilizing because it was CPU limited. Um, so it's quite a, you know, it's quite an exciting point. You know, there's a whole point of doing this new sync graph was to improve the performance. Um, this is another test data set that comes in from, this one is actually one that a member of the open sync graph community come in from the open MW world. He used this as a test data set. This data set was running at 15 Hertz, sorry, 50 Hertz on my machine um, with the open sync graph. Um, I got it running at 2,300 Hertz with the Vulcan sync graph. Exactly the same data, exactly the same visuals, but over 20 times faster. So, you know, that's an extreme example where the open scene graph wasn't really handling this data set at all well. Um, it's a synthetic data set. Um, it's just seemed to be designed for making the open scene graph fall to its knees. But the, the Vulcan scene graph, you know, doesn't mind actually 60 hertz, 600 hertz, you know, it's like, it, it just handles it without, you know, breaking a sweat. So, you know, where the open scene graph side, you might be in, you know, frame rate, um, cold times maybe of six, 10, 15 milliseconds. 
the Vulcan sync graph would often be like one or two milliseconds um, working on the same data set, and sometimes sub one millisecond for the the the, uh, the, rent, the record traversal. Um, so in that period, I was you know we were making sure we could load the open sync graph models and represent them reasonably, but also kind of it was a way to actually benchmark the Vulcan sync graph and making sure that I was going in the right direction. Um, if we kind of fast forward to 2000, um, sorry, 20, 2021, um, Andre Norman started contributing to the Vulcan uh, the BSG Exchange project, and he developed uh, an, an ASIMP loader and also image loaders, and um, also wrote some initial um, PBR shaders for it. And so this is an example of um, a PBR model uh, sorry, physics-based rendering um, with it from the GLTF data set. Um, nice thing is that we can now actually start moving on the in front of the open scene graph in terms of certain features like physics-based rendering. You know, the open scene graph, you can do that with the open scene graph, but it doesn't come with it out of the box. Whereas now we have that in the Vulcan scene graph. And we've had it since 2019. Um, another big thing that happened in 2000 um, and, and 2021 was that I started working for six months with the rival. And we were able to, um, so basically I worked three days a week with the rival and um, I was helping them basically develop um, visual simulation software to help them do their uh, robot training uh, with uh, AI models and also um, help and, you know, and during the actual process of just developing actual uh, manufacturing hardware and testing all of the, the robotics behind that. And so uh, they wanted a, a modern SYNGRAPH for that. So they helped fund that stage of development the Vulcan SYNGRAPH and I was developing software for them to help them you know, use the Vulcan Singer off within their, uh, their suite. Um, also in that period, um, one of the things I did was to do the same thing as the Open Singer off. Let's try and load points. So this is one of the VSG points example there. All right, I'm going to leave those examples right now, and um, I'm going to crack a beer open, and I recommend everyone does the same. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a little while now. I'm happy for everybody else to start um, chatting as well if you want. Um, what my plan is now is to go ahead and make the release. <laughs> um, okay. um, I've, I've, I've written a script for it, so it should be straightforward. Um, I don't know if you guys want to start a countdown or not. Um, so we're about 20 past nine. I'm going to crack open a beer. <laughs> oh, cheers. Um, so yeah, cheers everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Done, I don't have a nice slick presentation. I was hoping to do something equivalent to present three D um, with the Vulcan Syngraph, so I could use that write a presentation and do everything with the Vulcan Syngraph. Um, but I didn't have time. <laughs> I was supposed to be doing on Monday. I was uh, sorry on Friday. I was hoping to write it and then write the presentation yesterday, but I ended up just trying to fix build issues. Release work. <laughs> uh, one of the nightmares with writing software, which everybody will know, permutations of different platforms and build combinations is just, you know, it's so easy to break one thing on one platform. And yeah. So yeah. Uh, oh, Goblin. <laughs> British beer. Nice. Well, once you got a tag, let me know and uh, I'll be sure to get it up to Debian. Excellent.
I already um, had the, uh, everything prepackaged. I just need to wait for the armchair lawyers to approve everything. Right. Good. Um, if there's stuff that needs to get pushed back into the Vulcan Singer after help, things like packaging on Debian or any other packaging, um, let me know. And um, we can we can make another point release. Um, I'm I'm expecting my experience with the Open Singer project is that I would spend six weeks asking the community, please test, please test, please test. And there's be a lot of people who would test it. They would test it, they'd find problems, we'd fix them, we get to the release day, and there she all everything looks solid, looks fine. Make the release. And then within an hour or two, they'd be like, it doesn't work on my platform doesn't work and it's like well why didn't you test that i've been asking um so i kind of expect the same thing with the vulcan singer projects and what we'll inevitably need to do is, is make a patch release so i'll make that from so we have the vulcan singer of 1.0 branch and i'll maintain that and then make each of the point releases off that um broadly i'll aim for it to be um api compatible in that series um, so, kind of 1.0.0, and then 1.0.1, etc., will all be um, will aim to be binary compatible. Um, we may not be able to achieve that if there's a a problem that we can only fix by, you know, changing the API. Then you know we consider doing that, but that'd be kind of a last resort. So we keep it as a semantic versioning scheme major minor bug fix or yeah so um i'm basically once 1.0 branch is baked tonight that will be basically bug fixes and build fixes and trying trying to keep that abi compatible no more features so all the features will then go into um basically a 1.1 or basically um, vsg master which is basically the next developments profile will basically take. So Vulcan Singer of 1.0 branch will then sit there static and the rest of the Vulcan Singer will just kind of march on beyond it. So that's my plan. That's broadly what I've done with the Open Singer project and that seems to work mostly. But obviously in the last four and a half years, I've been writing the Vulcan Singer off. It's a bit broken <laughs> because I've hardly touched the Vulcan, the Open Singer off. Now I've done two weeks of paid work on the Open Singer off side. And probably about that much more on just bug fixes and merges. So probably only a month's work on the open graph work on in four and a half years. And yeah, that sucks for the open graph community. But yeah, I don't recommend people write Singraphs. It's hard work. <laughs> it's a huge amount of work. So yeah, I've been working a lot of hours in the last four and a half years. Um and yeah. So, um, you know, once 1.0 is out, my plan is to, you know, eventually have some more time for the open singer off, but not immediately. I need to rest. And I also need, I've got client work that's kind of backed up. So I, I will do all that work as well. Right. I'm going to go for it. Um, so I'll find the right console. Um, I hope Tim Moore is joining us. Hi, Tim. Um, so we have, uh, we have about 10, 12 of us on now. Um, if anybody wants to um, talk, um, then just let me know on the chat, and then I can, um, you know, give the, the power over to you if required. Okay, I'm going to share the screen now, and we can all watch me make mistakes. Okay, so I've written this little script that basically goes into the Vulcan Sync graph and then checks out the 1.0 branch and then runs a test. Um, and I'm typed in wrong. So basically, you'll list all the um, get commands to actually create the release, and then I can QA it before they actually run. So that's what I'm doing now.
And this is the important line. Hopefully everybody can read it. Okay, I'm just trying to spot any mistakes. <laughs> Although it's probably too late. Okay. It's done. Okay. <laughs> Vulcan Syngraph 1.0, Vulcan VSG Exchange 1.0. And VSG examples 1.0 should now be available to go everybody um, on GitHub. Ooh, congrats. Thank you. I'm just needing to check. <laughs> check everything's there. Yay. There we go. I think it should be there now. Thanks. All right, I can see 1.0 for the, um, the BSG. Let's have a look at BSG Exchange. I've got what, BSG Exchange 1.0. And then we've got BSG 1.0. Well, hey, it looks like the scripts worked. <laughs> All right, that's a huge relief. Is that thing with OSG to VSG in there? Um, I won't be updating OSG to, to VSG to 1.0 because I don't think it's ready yet. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to rewrite it. Um, so the bulk of OSG to VSG was written back in 2019 um, by Thomas Hogarth. And then I've since then updated bits as the bulk and C-graphs moved on. And I'm not, yeah, it's kind of, it was written before the era of um, shader sets and the Graphax pipeline configuration utility. Um, and it's just kind of clunky, basically. It's kind of, because it was written so early in the open scene graph, uh, the open scene graph um, life, there, you know, there wasn't so many nodes available and there wasn't so many utilities like shader set um available um so a lot of things that now are actually in the core vsg and much easier to access it had to build itself and if you look at it you'll find it's much more complicated than the asymp to uh, vsg um loader and i mean open sync graph is a lot more complicated than asymp in terms of number of nodes it has so there will be more naturally more work but there's a lot more overhead than, in there than there really should be um, and it should be possible to go back and write it from scratch much more cleanly. Um, but I guess that might take a month to do. Um, but uh, unless somebody pays me to work for a month solid on it, it'll have to be just done effectively in my kind of spare hours when I'm not working on client work and I'm not doing other, other duties, like fixing any other issues that appear in um, the 1.0 release once it goes out. Okay, um, I'm going to present one more little bit um, before I start encouraging you guys to start chatting about your own um, use of the, the Vulcan Syngraph and your own works or anything else you want to announce. Um, I see that Tim's more Moore's on now, so hopefully he'll be able to chat about the VSG Earth work and perhaps present some of that. Um, now, one of the bits of, um, so from November through to July, I was mostly taking sabbatical from client work to try and get 1.0 done. And I almost got there. <laughs> and then I broke my, my, my arm about there. And so for two months, basically, I was kind of half out of commission. Um, so that kind of pushed the release back and also pushed my client work act. Um, but once I got the cast off, I started doing client work in October. I also got COVID. So I had a week kind of 
working but kind of sick <laughs> for a week in October. Um, anyway, so one of the client projects I did um, in October um, was uh, work with um, Atlas Computers in Ireland, and they specialize in rendering uh, LiDAR data sets. Um, so they typically would have a data set of, say, 200,000 points or 400,000 points. And so they're kind of looking at adopting the Vulcan Syngraph for rendering. And so I was commissioned by Shane um, to basically develop a little VSG points library. Um, so now there's a, if people might remember from the VSG examples, there was one called VSG points. And now, um, if you actually go to my um, personal repositories, um, you'll actually find VSG points in there. And what VSG points can do, um, if I bring up the original example, so the original example could render, say, uh, 10, 20 million points and have normals on them, so you could do lighting and you could do point sprites, which is okay. This is a very simple example. Um, but if you want to deal with data sets when you're trying to deal with, say, 400,000 points, um, you get problems with trying to fit that amount of data, you know, X, Y, Z, normal on a color uh, for, for, you know, 400 million points becomes a bit of a challenge uh, because it doesn't fit on the actual uh, graphics hardware. Um, so one of the things we did with the VSG points project was to trial using shorts and um, optionally a bytes to represent the X, Y, Z locations of, and then tile it so that um, you get basically lots of little bricks each one, which is a, a zero to two five five range, or zero to uh, one six uh, three five. Oh, I can't do the maths in my head right now. Two to the power of sixteen. Um, so you can have these bricks with lots of little points within them, and if you arrange the a thousand or ten thousand of these bricks, you can actually um, reduce the precision you need to represent the points in your system. And you can, you know, reduce the amount of footprint on the actual graphics card down to a quarter. And by doing that, you then you don't have to actually sample anymore. You can just render every single point you data set. Um, so here we go. Um, and modern computers. Um, so I this is all running on an um, an AMD fifty seven hundred G. Um, kind of mid to higher range CPU from AMD with onboard graphics. And I'm rendering at 1320 or by um, 1800 pixels. So it's quite a high display. And lots and lots of points. If you zoom in, you can might get to see some artifacts from the actual uh, point sprites. Um, I'm getting on this onboard GPU, I ran about 1.8 billion points per second in performance, which I just find stupendous. Um, back at the early days of the, the OpenSingra project, I started walking, working on an Onyx um, at the Digital Design Studio in Glasgow School of Art. And you know, that in theory could do 12 million points uh, per second. It couldn't, you know, you had to actually, you know, come up with a, a very specific type of um, data packaging for it, which isn't something you could do with a normal single graph. Um, you know, fast forward today, we don't have a massive you know, graphics supercomputer for it. This is an onboard GPU and it's rendering almost 2 billion um, points per second. Um, which I'm just kind of trying to cast it by. Uh, so, okay, so VSG Points is now a separate project, and um, the plan is to develop that over the time. 
um, partly down to the needs of um, um, what Shane has at um, Atlas Computers, but also it's open source now. It's under the MIT license, like the rest of the open uh, the Vulcan SIGGRAPH, um, so people can contribute to that. Um, there may be also ideas in using that type of packaging um, that we can use elsewhere. So if you have the, the, the data sets, other meshes, uh, just have an extraordinarily large amount of data that you want to represent without culling any of the data, without any LODs, you just want to brute force it to the graphics are, but then you could easily um, start packaging it up, creating a unit cube cell for your vertex data, and then pack it, packaging it as bytes or shorts. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop with the issue points. And um, that brings me fast forward to today, basically. Um, I wish I could share some of the other project work I've done. Um, unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> It's client work um, and it's not open source. Um, would anybody else like to start contributing? I see there's a couple of um, comments in the chat. Um, so I'll just have a quick read through. Um, <laughs> questions. Um, I'm not sure how good I'll be there using questions. My brain's a bit, um, I don't know. Everyone knows what's making a release this night. <laughs> your brain starts using out your ear and stuff like that. I could try and think about all the different permutations and things. Um, in terms of um, the Moots question about um, Blender 3.0, um, I haven't tinkered with Blender um, or you know, not for about 15 years. Um, so I, you know, my, the first path will be use the ASIMP path and try and find what are the modern formats that ASIMP loads well and maps to the Vulcan Singroff uh, well. Um, and just try it basically. And the, um, if you use, you can load them directly. Um, just by loading your files and linking to VSG Exchange. Um, or you can use VSG Conf, um, as Gareth is suggesting, um, and you can convert them to .vsv and then, and then load them. Um, in general, in development work, it's dead easy, just a link to the VSG Exchange library and, and load it up. So most of the VSG examples, um, or a lot of the VSG examples do that uh, and should be straightforward for folks. Um, I um, the VSG exchange. Uh, I'll try and put that. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the link to VSG points. Um, uh, let's see if I can look it up. So it's currently under my personal um, account. Um, so Robert Osfield, VSG points. I'll stick that into the chat. Now it's very early days on that. So there's a, basically a week's work. Um, and at this point, the most interesting thing about it is the idea of using um, rather than just normal kind of VEC threes, using an unsigned byte VEC four for your X Y Z and then an extra attribute, or an unsigned short, so a US VEC um, four uh, for packaging your data, and then you use the model view matrix to scale a unit cube, uh, because when you read those um, unsigned bytes or unsigned shorts. Um, you read them as a zero to one float. Um, did cry then. Sorry, there's a mention that um, there's an error to it. It originally was private. I wonder if it still is now. So I'll go and add that in. 
this product. Right, I can't remember how to make it public if it's not public already. Um, right, I'll do that afterwards because it, it is open source. Um, and so everyone should be able to access that. Um, but I'm not going to do it like that. <laughs> thinking around. Right, um, does anybody else want to take the floor this evening? You mentioned my name earlier, and I don't actually have any um, more PSG Earth to show off, unfortunately, on the computer I'm on right now. But I, I posted some announcements of what I did over the summer. Yeah. Um, and this is in terms of a prototype port of VSG Earth to use, uh, a prototype port, port of OSG Earth to use VSG. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're waiting for more funding to continue on a second round of it. But um, what we have working is similar to what uh, Robert did in the VSG page LOD example, except it supports much more of the uh, OSG Earth dot Earth syntax. So you can combine um, image layers and elevation layers in the way than you can in OSG Earth. And um, the approach I used was not to try to rewrite the graphics code within OSG Earth, which is an enormous application at this point, but use OSG Earth as a data source and then parse the elevation data and image data supplied by all its layers uh, into a VSG scene graph and basically a page LOD kind of scheme. And it uh, has worked out pretty well uh, in terms of effort of development and all that. And um, I'm happy. I think our clients are happy. And I'm looking forward to continuing this work. So long term, do you, do you think that will continue with the kind of dual approach? SGS for data representation and loading, and then Vulcan Sync Graph for, for rendering? Well, I, I think that that makes sense. I mean, there's just so much code there to develop to interface with the different GIS formats that OSGR supports and um, the image sources and then all the projects they're doing. Um, I, I don't think it really has any performance implications to do it that way. The data has got to come from someplace. And, um, you know, in OSGR, they have a kind of different terrain engine style. It's quite different from the um, page LED approach in Open Scene Graph and in VSG. But that's okay. You can still just get the data out of the layers, which are a different extraction yeah. than the, the lower level graphics data structures that would go into either Open Scene Graph or VSG. So we'll see, you know, it's one of these things where um, if we had to rewrite it from the ground up, we'd never do it. So we've got to start someplace and it's, it's you know, a, so a, a nice, nice barrier there. How many lines of code is OSGS? Uh, well, here I can go look and get back to you on that. <laughs> uh, Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, you know, it's it's you know hundreds of thousands. I would say it's you know it's it's. Definitely bigger than than the open scene graph source, at least I think it is. So um, the the open scene graph is about half a million. So all right, well, okay, then then I think that's not correct. I, I doubt that it's quite that much, but it's probably in a couple of hundred thousand lines. Yeah. So a lot of the open scene graph is actually the loaders, <laughs> not the actual scene graph yeah. itself. Um, yeah. 
And that's actually one of the reasons why I've kept the Vulcan Singer off and the VSG Exchange separate as a different life, because you're, you're forever writing loaders. And it can happen at a different rate. You know, a sing graph, I'm hoping with the Vulcan sing graph, it will actually become quite stable compared to the open sing graph. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll add new features in terms of new Vulcan features and perhaps new sing graph features, but it won't try and compass, it won't try and do all the things that the open sing graph did. Um, it won't try and, you know, be things that are to everybody. You know, it's basically going to stay a, a, a sing graph with all the basic features of that. And currently that sits at about 60,000 lines of code um, for the Vulcan sing graph. Um, so that's slightly over a tenth of the open sing graph, but the open sing graph has all this extra stuff in. Um, VSG Exchange, I think, is around about the same size and not quite as big as the Vulcan sing graph. Uh, most of that's kind of uh, the KTX um, loader. Um, which is basically third-party code we brought, pulled in um, to, to load KTX image files. Um, and VSG examples is quite large as well, but I haven't actually looked at it um, in terms of uh, lines, lines of code. I've mainly been focusing on the Vulcan scene graph. And these ancillary projects, um, obviously I've touched Vulcan and VSG exchange extensively in the last four and a half years. Um, VSG examples, has been focused really on testing features in the Vulcan Sync Graph. As I've written them, I've added new examples. Um, they haven't been written from the point of view of, oh, well, let's teach somebody how to do it. It's been like, well, oh, I just need something to test it. Um, so uh, hopefully VSG examples will become more of a, an example set for people um, going forwards. Okay. I think uh, OSG Earth is probably around Thousand okay. Big. Yeah. Um, somebody else has got a big project on here. Is uh, Brett, Brett Curtis? Yeah. <laughs> OpenMW has been a passion project for a while since uh, its roots in two thousand seven, and uh, uh, it's been glorious and uh, difficult. <laughs> but. Uh, there is a sub faction uh, of our community that decided to uh, fork it and uh, port it to VSG. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have lost contact with them, which is really strange, but uh, it's all part of the mystique and the drama around this free and open source world we live in. Uh, but I don't know, have they been in contact with you uh, mm -hmm. at all, Robert? No, not of late. So back in the summer, um, I had an, an anonymous person contact me with patches to the Vulcan sing graph. Yes. And then they eventually disclosed that it was actually related to the OpenMW project. And it wasn't going to be uh, just basically, uh, it's, it was a paid for development, I think. Um, and they weren't going to go public with it until it was we went to VSG 1.0. And that was in the summer, but VSG 1.0 yeah. was obviously slipped. Um, yeah, as software projects do. <laughs> One's yeah, well... marketing deadlines. Um, so I was in contact with that developer a lot in August and September, but not much since. Not, not perhaps even the kind of end of August. And then not much since. So I, I don't know what's happened to that. So yeah, so there is a Vulcan singer of port of OpenMW that's sitting there hanging. And I presume you've got, an, uh, you, as a product lead now, you've got to decide you've got OpenMW based on the Open singer to get to 1.0. Yeah, the, at some the point. Interesting, yeah, the interesting thing about that is that uh, this individual has done a fantastical amount of work. I mean, not just uh, in terms of trying to do a one per one port of what we already have, but uh, the also adding additional features that are, are, are really only feasible in uh, Vulkan. And uh, 
it's just very strange how that has turned out. Uh, but the, the idea is, is that we will eventually transition over to using VSG, uh, but that really is dependent on the future of OSG. If OSG is going to be maintenance only, then that, uh, that makes it very clear to us where we should be shifting our focus. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for the last four and a half years, You've probably been aware that the open single op in all intents and purposes is in maintenance mode and then you know when in the spring when i started talking to my client who funded the first year and a half of the vulcan single op project um i kind of at that point tried to put vulcan the open single off into a state that was stable so i kind of focused on just kind of stability and that was 3.6.5 um, and then, you know, the hope that, well, it's a stable up now and people won't want to push it too hard and give me some time to go away from it and then I can come back. Now, it's, you know, we were hoping that we might be able to get BSG 1.0 out after a couple of years. Um, but that hasn't happened. It turns out writing a scene graph is a lot more work, even when you've written one before. Um, so, yeah, so it's taken us four and a half years. Um, and my plan is to go back and do some more maintenance in the open scene graph. Um, and I think there is probably a Zoom call for the open scene graph community to figure out the path we take. And I, you know, there's certain things as a product lead I can see as being necessary, but obviously um, we need to figure out how we actually maintain it going forwards. But I don't think as a base it makes much sense to really push the functionality in it. Um, it may even make sense to start making um, the open scene graph adopt certain features from the Vulcan scene graph. So I was been developing the open scene graph for, for almost two decades. And it was getting to a point that I couldn't really do a lot of the things I wanted to do because of backwards compatibility. Um, and that's one of the advantages with going fresh with the Vulcan scene graph is like, that's it, everything, build everything up from the ground up everything can be focused on performance and mapping Vulcan efficiently and to get the best out of Vulcan. And Vulcan exists to get the best out of the hardware. And that's what you're trying to do in the end, get the best out of your CPU and your GPU, get as much throughput through, through as possible. Um, and so it just changes the way you think about things. So, but there's certain things I've done in the open scene graph, like the, the VSG allocator, which handles block allocation of scene graph objects like data and nodes, um, so that all the nodes are kind of in the open scene graph will be allocated into blocks of, um, by default, be like um, 16 megabytes blocks be allocated. Um, and then within that block, you'll only get objects going or nodes going into that block. And then the next block along will just only get data objects. So when you're traversing the scene graph in memory, the nodes tend to be, they will all be in um, the same block in memory. So when you're pulling that, those nodes from the graph, so you, you traverse through the scene graph, culling nodes as you go through, you have to read the bounding sphere and the pointers as you traverse through the scene graph, and that's a memory access. So as you traverse through the scene graph, trying to cull as much as you can, you basically have to basically read from memory all the time. And the more disjoint map memory is across um, um, that those nodes are stored in memory, the more cache misses you have. The more cache misses, misses you have, the slower your traverse will be. And so taking a real focus in on, you know, um, compacting the nodes, which I did with developing scene graph and avoiding if statements uh, is how I basically got that time times improvement in traversal speed. And the other thing with the, the allocator is that um, it helps just pack things together. So as you traverse through the scene graph, you won't be bouncing around in memory so much. You should get less cache misses, and that should help the call traversal um, and the draw traversal be faster. So there's things like that, which we potentially could add back into the good back port to the open scene graph that could be quite beneficial. Um, the threading support um, using um, C++ 10's threading potentially could just get rid of um, open threads. And, you know, open threads, 
is there for historical reasons? You know, we needed a, a threading, a cross-platform threading library back in 2001 to be able to do the same thing as, you know, having a, a multi-pipe on X system. Um, we have multiple CPUs and multi-GPUs, you need threading. Um, and then, you know, back in 2001, there wasn't any C++ threading library. There was pthreads that only existed on Unix systems, and then you had Windows threads. Um, so P, uh, um, Open Threads was written um, by Sean Spicer when he was working at Magic Earth, when they ported from Performer to the Open Syngraph, to the Open Syngraph, he developed Open Threads and donated it. And so we adopted that and then maintained it. Then unfortunately, Sean disappeared off and into management and I had to maintain Open Threads from there onwards. Um, and the same happened to producer. Um, so, um, it's there really just for backwards compatibility now. Um, if we, you know, for say Open, so open Syngraph 3.8, we could say, oh, I'll just adopt C10. Um, but I think for 3.6, it's going to be very few changes, just compile changes, make sure it's compiling on latest systems. That's it. And new features making decisions like things like VSG allocator and threading adopting things like that, um, do you ad adopt them? Um, and there's other classes like the maths libraries in the VSG are much closer to GLSL by a uh, decision of mine is quite early on, is that try and make everything as close to GLSL as possible. So, um, but changing the maths library within the open scene graph could be a significant task. Um, I, you know, so there's, there's, Decisions, you know, you can kind of figure out which ones are the most benefit. I think VSG allocator porting that to the open scene graph would probably be a sensible thing to try and do. And the threading, it won't give any new features. It just gets rid of a, a dependency. Um, so that's kind of, yeah. So basically just choose what features, but I wouldn't suggest trying to push the performance of open scene graph too much because it's just, hiding onto nothing. Um, what you really need to do is to, you know, if you want performance, you care about performance in your application, do you need to stop and use the Vulcan Sync Graph? You know, it's just so much more, it's so much easier to get a good performing application with the Vulcan Sync Graph because of the lower CPU overheads. You know, quite often with the Open Sync Graph, you'll have to be kind of massaging the Sync Graph to make it as efficient as possible and you know, batching geometry and state as much as possible. Um, because there's so much overhead associated with them and the um, support for shaders and uniforms is quite slow in OpenGL and in in the open scene graph and doing these things in the Vulcan scene graph is just really efficient you know because you're using Vulcan and um, it's a different model but there's just so much more performance there and you know if you've been struggling with your column draw breaking frame in the Vulcan in the open scene graph, which is not unusual for a big application. You know, you might be getting say a cold traversal of four milliseconds and a draw traversal of 10 milliseconds. It doesn't take much to break a frame. But if you've got, you know, in the case of the Vulcan scene graph, we actually only have one traversal, which is a record traversal. And then you submit the whole batch of data. Um, you, um, you submit it to the queue and it gets sent to, um, to Vulcan is basically just pointer pointers being moved around and then just resubmit the data directly. Um, so it, it's just so much more efficient. You know, things might, you know, might take 10 milliseconds for the open scene graph for uh, traversals, it might take a minute second for the open scene graph. So thinking about, oh, I have to optimize the scene graph and have to use threading to try and get rid of random the performance issues, they just aren't there. I and mean, quite often you could just write your application single threaded. You don't have to optimize your scene graph because it's going to be so efficient anyway. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, it'd be interesting to see how people get on. You know, there, there's threading support in the Vulcan scene graph and the same, you know, and the Vulcan is, is highly multi-threaded. And we could go on about how important that is and stuff like that. And it can be really valuable, but for a lot of application developers, I think actually the pressure on being multi-threaded from the scene graph side will just drop because the performance will be so good out of the box. Um, 
one thing to know that one of the decisions I've made with the Vulcan scene graph, um, the open scene graph basically always has culling by default on every single node and every single node has a bounding sphere associated with it. And it does that test every single time it hits a node. And with Vulcan scene graph, nodes don't by default have culling. Um, only special nodes in the scene graph that choose to provide culling have that culling. So you have LOD nodes, they have a bounding sphere and LOD ranges, same as page LOD nodes. And you have a cull node and a, a cull group that basically have a bounding sphere that can use the video pressure and culling on, and that will cull a sub graph. Um, but you can choose where to put them in your scene graph. So certain things, so if I wanted to say render a, um, a sky model, or say that all the stars and um, visible stars from Earth, um, you know, wherever view you're in space, you're going to see the stars. So there's no point in culling them. So you just don't decorate that subgraph with a column node. With the open scene graph, you have to actually switch off culling. You know, you have to play games by setting the node saying, don't cull me, please, um, because I'm doing some funky stuff and my bounding sphere is, is invalid. Um, so it, it changes the responsibility from being the scene graph to basically the scene graph creator can decide where best place to put call nodes. Um, and because of that, you can, you know, you can do some things like thing, you know, not do culling for things that are always going to be drawn, or don't do culling for things that the vertex shader places in a different place where the banding sphere is. So you know, there's no point having a banding sphere because it, the vertex shaders are moving it around. Um, or if you're doing compute shaders, you, know, you have a scene graph that just does compute. That has no, you know, culling doesn't make any sense. You know, so that's there's lots of decisions made within the Vulcan scene graph that are based on that kind of principle of, well, how do you get the best performance? How do you get the best flexibility? And often that means giving responsibility to the application developer or the, the scene graph loader um, to make the decisions about how best to represent that in the scene graph um, rather than making decisions for you, which the open scene graph does a lot of. And a bit like OpenGL, you know, it makes a lot of decisions for you, um, which is great if you, all you need is that type of model. But once you go off that kind of narrow road, OpenGL gets very bumpy and Open scene graph gets very bumpy. Um, and whereas, you know, effectively with the Vulcan scene graph, you're not given any road. <laughs> you're just basically given the map and navigate yourself type of thing. Um, but with a, you know, it gives a lot more power to a developer who knows what they're doing. Um, and for developers who don't know what they're doing, it's probably so fast anyway that you can probably with modern hardware, you can throw everything at it and it'll probably still run at 60 hertz, um, which is kind of obscene, but that's where we are. Graphics hardware is incredibly fast. Modern is just astonishing. Um, all right, does anybody else want to present anything? Um, I see we've got a link to um, VSG VR. Should I run that link? Um, you can, it's, it's not a very good video, to be honest. It's kind of, I haven't had time to fix things. Um, that's just a note that, that it is there. I'm working on it when I get the time. Um, it's a, so kind of the, the good news with that is that, um, if, if, if someone does want to integrate VSG with things like OpenXR and other Vulcan based interfaces and things, um, I had very little trouble other than learning how OpenXR works and kind of the VSG side of it was fairly straightforward to get that running in a VR headset. Um, okay. Getting a nice into it, it is good. Yeah, sure. I will share that. Okay, hopefully people can see the, the video running. So you've loaded a couple of models and you've set up the input for the 
the controllers and they're controlling the uh, the visuals of the controllers and they kind of they're just rendering a left eye and right eye and separate two separate scene graphs oh sorry two uh, two separate cameras i presume um pretty much yes um there's a another video there with the castle scene as well that's a little bit prettier um so most of the setup is the open xr kind of runs the application wants to run the application loop for you um but in the end what you get is it uh it lets you provide a couple of views it gives you things like view and projection matrices yeah um so you configure the vsg scene graph to render into two views um i think i can't remember if i did it with two cameras in one traversal in the end i might have reworked that um but essentially it's you render the scene from two slightly different viewpoints those go to open xr sticks in the headset it feeds back the new poses for the next frame etc yeah um and then binding models into the scene graph is kind of open xr gives you a pose for the controller so you update a node to be where that controller is and stick a model on it the scene graph side of it's a relatively simple um kind of the blocker and difficult bit on all that at the moment is uh working out kind of a viewer and window kind of classes for that to make it nice to use versus um kind of at the moment i had to copy sections of vsg out to the vr wrappers um so anytime a change happens in vsg i don't automatically get it and then i have to manually fix my copy of the code which is just a bad way to be writing that at the moment yeah i haven't done a review of it so maybe it's worth us sitting you know virtually sitting down and working through kind of resolving those changes um one thing that may be worth keeping in mind is that i have considered um implementing the multi-view extension um, i've done that for the open scene graph and i've thought about doing that for the vulcan scene graph but I haven't had a, a need for my, you know, on my client base to do it. Obviously, it just takes time. Um, but I think it'd be kind of nice to have the shaders with that inbuilt. So right now, when you're doing multi-view with the open scene graph, you have to write your own custom shaders for it. And what I'd like is to be able to just have it use the pragmatic shader composition so that you have an if diff def block in the vertex shader that, you know, in a standard scene graph, you just have a, a single projection matrix and a single model view matrix. Whereas in the case of the multi view for stereo, um, or if you've got, um, I guess you might have more than two views if you've kind of got the high resolution inserts for the eyes, um, you would actually use multi view for that. And then have, um, and rather than having a single um, projection matrix, I was thinking about having um, a projection matrix per eye. And then putting the uh, modification to the model view matrix, um, the local one for the left and the right eye the translation into that projection matrix offset. Um, so you basically, I would change the projection matrix from wrong, being a push constant to a uniform, but a projection matrix doesn't change that very often in the scene graph. So having it as a uniform wouldn't be expensive. And that would give us that ability Essentially, to quite easily take all the existing shaders and just have them work in stereo with multi view. Um, right now, I presume you aren't you're not playing with shaders. You're just rendering a scene graph. Uh, yeah, it's basically just uh, making a camera with the matrices that OpenXR gives us. Um, kind of the only issues is that OpenXR has a lot of control, so it directly gives you a projection matrix and a view matrix. Yeah. Um, it may be for one combined view, it might be two eyes in most cases, it could be three or four depending on the OpenXR driver. Um, it, it supports things like Android tablets doing yeah. AR and things as well. So uh, There's a lot of possibilities in that stuff. Um, yeah, there's some quite novel devices out there as well, which kind of, kind of the hollow decks type stuff which can render many, many views, um, which we might want to implement at, at some. Um, does anybody else want to make any comments?
Um, I've got a question from David Glenn saying, greetings, Robert. From a newbie perspective, can one port open single off code to the VSG? Um, I think the best person to answer a question like that would be Tim Moore, <laughs> because he's, he's, you know, he's helped make a port of um, um, that. And also the engineer worked with um, porting um, OpenMW to Vulcan Syngraph would be probably a good person to ask. Um, for myself, I think um, Vulcan Syngraph will be a natural usage for a new application. So if you've got a new project and it's like, do I use Open Syngraph, Vulcan Syngraph, or some other project, um, and you've got Open Syngraph experience, then that knowledge of Syngraphs will probably help you more with porting to the Vulcan Syngraph or using the Vulcan Syngraph than adopting another library that has a different kind of mindset of writing it. So, um, you know, if you're familiar with the open sync graph and how my brain works, then you come across a Vulcan sync graph, there's going to be a bit of shock because it's kind of different. It's, it's, it is a different sync graph. Um, but there's some lots of things, lot, the best things from the open sync graph you'll see in the Vulcan sync graph. So the visitors, reference pointer, and observer pointer. Um, things like that, they're good. There's nothing wrong with them. You know, they're improved slightly because of C++ 17. Essentially, they're the same. Um, so for new projects, I, I, you know, I would strongly recommend looking at the Vulcan Syngraph um, for your team because they will already know a little bit about open Syngraphs and, and porting it across. Yes, there's more to learn about Vulcan and the Syngraph. Um, but there is some kind of, I guess, the DNA of, of you know, there's you know, this, this commonality between those two projects, and it's mainly my DNA. Um, the taking an existing Open Sync Graph application and porting it to Vulkan Sync Graph um, gives you a dilemma. Do you do it um, from scratch? You know, do, do you just basically write, I'm just going to replace all the Vulkan, the Open Sync Graph stuff um, with Vulkan Sync Graph? And just ditch the open scene graph work. Um, I mean, in some ways, you end up with a better application, but there's a period when you don't have anything working, which isn't good. Um, the other approach would be to kind of try and abstract away from the scene graph side of things. Um, but personally, I wouldn't recommend that because that's just having a scene graph API, which abstracts from the graphics API. So you've got then another layer of abstraction on top of the two scene graphs. And the two scene graphs are quite different. You know, OpenGL and Vulkan are very different. And because Open scene graph is very closely associated with OpenGL, and Vulkan scene graph is very closely associated with Vulkan, and Vulkan and OpenGL are basically water and oil, they don't mix. You know, there's a few overlaps, like GLSL is an overlap, and the concept of uniforms and vertex arrays, they're common between the two. Um, but with the, um, they're, they're quite different. Um, how you do state is going to be different. I mean, if your single graph application uses a lot of um, shaders already and lots of uniforms, then they may port across more readily to the Vulcan single graph. And one thing with Vulcan is that it's pure shaders. There's no there's no fixed function pipeline. Um, the open single graph, sorry, the Vulcan single graph provides the concept of a shader set, which is an, an kind of pre-built shaders that can provide lighting and um, texturing for you. So it gets some, some way towards having a fixed function pipeline. Um, so you can use pragmatic shader composition to switch on how many shaders you're using and how many lights you're using, um, which is kind of similar to OpenGL modes. Um, and pragmatic shader composition is, is something that's in the Vulcan Sync Graph and the Open Sync Graph. Um, Basically, I wrote it when I was working on the open scene graph, and it's one of those things that wasn't broken. It's one of my better ideas, so I ported that across the Vulcan scene graph. Um, the only difference in those two implementation is with the open scene graph, you can inject um, more, um, you can inject like values and functions in the actual defines you define. Whereas the Vulcan scene graph, it's just uh, a toggle, you know, it's like um, define or not defined. Um, I've just kept it simple, and there's enough complexity going on that you know 
I just wanted to have them mapped to the equivalent of OpenGL nodes so you can switch on and off. Um, what if you're going to tackle a project? I think the first thing to do is you know just start with some prototype projects and just experiment um, without any OpenGL and without OpenSync graph. Just try and get some models loaded up. So you, you could use the OSG2 VSG loader on some of your existing models. Copy across the scene graph, the Vulcan scene graph as data across, and then try it with VSG viewer um, or try and write some application code that just allows your team just to get familiar with how you do traversals, um, how you load data, how you modify data um, with the Vulcan scene graph. And once they've just written some you know, brief prototype applications that do a little bit of what your main application do, does, but kind of tests out the kind of key features of your main application, then the, your team will then have an idea of, okay, how does it port? And when you do port across, you might choose to do something quite different. You know, there's new opportunities with the Vulcan Scene Graph. You have compute and um, graphics under the same umbrella. Um, you have mesh shaders. You have ray tracing. There's lots of different possibilities of solving problems that you don't have in the OpenGL OpenSync graph of. Um, so when you update your application, you may choose to kind of embrace these new realms of, of graphics. You know, it's not just like, oh, I'll have a one-to-one -one mapping of Vulcan Sync graph to so Open Sync graph to Vulcan Sync graph, but actually kind of learn about, about Vulcan Sync graph, learn a bit about Vulcan, learn about some of the possibilities it introduces and then start porting across. Now, if you've got you know, a big application, it's quite you know, overwhelming, but it might be that you can choose you know, parts of that application and then just port them across. Um, it is possible to have the two in one application and it's even possible to render um, in OpenGL and OpenSync graph to a, um, an image in memory, so a frame buffer, a uh, frame buffer object, and then use that frame buffer object on the Vulcan side and the other way around. So you could render to a frame buffer object essentially in, in Vulcan, and then you then copy that data into the OpenGL side. And then there's OpenGL extensions to synchronizing the two. It does add complexity, but um, that's what you can um, you know, potentially do with an OpenGL application that you're porting to the Vulcan Sync Graph. You know, rather than actually trying to do it all at once, you choose certain things, perhaps of the biggest bottlenecks in your application on the kind of like big CPU bottlenecks that you need to address and fix. So you just then, you know, you look at what those features are, you port those, you know, recreate those in a pure Vulcan Sync Graph application, get familiar with them, and then, you know, integrate it into your application. Um, but it's certainly daunting. I wouldn't, you know, um, you can talk to myself. Um, there's a other engineers like Tim Moore who are available for doing consulting um, to chat to, um, to see how about going about it. Um, and kind of 10 years time, Vulcan scene graphs could be pretty mature. And the open scene graph, you know, it will see updates in that period, but it's not going to suddenly become a new great scene graph. You know, it's, it's had its 20 years in the limelight. Um, so, you know, I, I would certainly start thinking about porting it at some point. Um, and how you do that, you know, you can either talk to myself and we can talk about consulting on it um, or talk to somebody like Tim uh, or just join the community and I'll ask questions. How do I do this? Um, and over time, I expect we to get more experience as a community about how we port open sync graph applications to the Vulcan sync graph. Um, projects like the VSG OpenMW project, that is an example that potentially it's open source. So potentially open scene graph developers couldn't actually look at the two projects, the open, the open scene graph version and the, the Vulcan scene graph one, and see you know, how these things are done. And you know, it might take six months to, to, to redo it and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it depends on the complexity of your application. Okay, is there any more questions? We've been chatting. Just a quick comment on, on what you said, Robert. Um, I agree with everything Robert just said. Uh, that an open scene, that a, a port will probably end up being something like a different application. 
However, at the very lowest level, uh, I found using open scene graph um, data structures within the new app was fine, um, both on the math level. Uh, if you already have code that does math using the open scene graph math functions and libraries, just use it and, and use the result at the end. Uh, it's fine. And the other thing is that open scene graph images are fine as a sort of current common currency and application. Uh, if your app creates images in a complicated way, you can keep them as OSG images up to the end and then load them as as BSG data and textures when you need to or something. It's just that's something I found doing with the BSG report. But that's my comment. Yeah, I'm I guess another thing I would like to add, um, if you've got a team thinking about porting, um, I was actually a quite a jaded developer back in kind of 2017, 2018. Uh, you know, I've been working on the Open Singer off professionally um, for 17 years already, and I've been working on it for a you know, year and a half before that, before I went professional um, and set up business back in 2001. Um, you know, you're working as a developer for many years on the same thing or, you know, and a big project, it's actually, it's tough. Um, physically and mentally, just, you know, there's lots of legwork you have to go through. Um, with the Vulcan Syngraph, I was able to actually learn C++ 17 and use it on a real project to actually learn it properly and adopt things in a more modern way and um, try and make code as expressive as possible. And that's one of the nice things about C++ 17 onwards is there is lots of things you can do, even the simple things like a for loop. Um, you can iterate through a container without using iterators. You know, it's just like small things like that. Um, auto is another thing that just actually just cleans code up. And uh, with the VSG, when you um, you don't do a new and delete with the VSG, um, you don't do a new VSG group. What you do is a VSG group create, and that creates the object on the on the heap, um, actually allocated within one of these blocks. For efficiency purposes and then it passes back a reference pointer so rather than passing back a c pointer that you could possibly leak accidentally um and then you have to cast it to a you know particular type like a reference pointer you need to make sure they're two matched up you could leak memory otherwise and the when you're actually using just um bsg group create it passes back a reference pointer to um the group so you can use auto group is equal to group create. And it becomes much easier, just, you know, you don't have to think about memory management anymore. You know, you didn't, you know, the OSG had reference pointers and stuff like that. And it did help these things a lot. Um, but when it becomes so expressive to do things and just, you know, less code to just do the same thing, it becomes much more, you know, it becomes much more, much fun, more fun to write the code. And obviously I've learned, had to learn Vulkan and that's been really daunting, I've got to be said. Um, interesting thing is that um, Don Burns is also working on all the Vulkan Singer off these days. Um, he's, his company's adopted it um, for their application. You know, we've both got between us, I guess about 50 years of experience with OpenGL and both of us moving to Vulkan, well, Vulkan is like, Whoa, it's it's quite overwhelming. Um, but so it does take a while to get there, but it's just, yeah, um, I, I enjoy writing the code now. You know, I've learned all these things and the code is actually really simple to, to work with. You know, I've just started working on a new client project and start putting things together. It just comes together quite naturally. And it's just more streamlined than it would be with Open Scene Graph even though Vulcan itself is more awkward to work with. Um, we've got far enough along now with the Syngraph that a lot of these things are actually quite natural and expressive. And I think it really helps kind of making it fun and engaging. So if you've got a jaded team that's been working on the Open Syngraph and an application that's been around for 15 years, and you suddenly get new toys to play with and new stuff to learn, um, you can get engineers who are kind of quite jaded 
and turn them around and, and, and get them enjoying their day and wanting to, you know, kick in at you know, early hours and leave late hours and get annoyed their wives and children and stuff <laughs> and get them obsessed with it. Um, so, yeah, it, it's certainly fun to work with. As David said, it has a new toy. Everyone loves a new toy. <laughs> and so the Golden Scene Graph now is 1.0. So it's, it's no longer a toy, I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> But it's one other thing to add is um, my wife has been calling when we when I tried to get Open Scene Graph 1.0 out back in it was about 2003 onwards until 2005 December when we finally got it. She called it the mythical 1.0. And so I started my business in 2001, and then in 2005 December, like four and a half years later. And the, the OSG was already two years old by that starting point. So it took like six and a half years to, from Don tinkering with it to getting a 1.0 release out. Um, for the VSG, you've done that in four and a half years. And the Vulcan Syngraph 1.0 is probably equivalent to Open Syngraph 2.0 in terms of its feature availability, you know, like having shaders. Actually, the VSG's got a pragmatic shader composition, which is a 3.0, OpenGL 3.0 feature. So there's lots of things. Um, and the serialization in the Vulcan scene graph is just better than it is in the Open scene graph. Um, so there's lots of things that are just done better, and, and it's only four and a half years. So um, yeah, it's taken a lot of work, but <laughs> it's happened a lot faster than it did happen with the um, Open scene graph. Um, and there's also been for the last two years, I guess, there's been commercial applications using the Vulcan Um, um yeah. So, yeah, like the Open Syngraph, just like that, you know, it had people using it professionally before it got to 1.0. Um, but yeah, it's nice to put the underline to 1.0. Um, all right, any more questions for anybody? Um, David's just mentioned about performer. I've got, um, I will share a screen. I've had performer town on my, my machine, and we're able to render it with open scene graph. And then you can render it with open scene graph. You can work with the, the OSG. So I'll um, say it works. Um, so this isn't rendered quite correctly, but hopefully people can see Performer Town. Um, this is because OSG to VSG needs some more work. Um, so it didn't have proper lighting when it was written. Um, but you can see everything is actually kind of the trees are moving around. Um, I don't think the geometries are quite mapped, mapped correctly. Um, So this model was originally an open flight and then into performer. There we go, fun bit of history. Doesn't look as good as it looks in the OSG. I run it with the OSG, right, what it should look like. Okay, so if we spend some more time on the uh, OSG to VSG, then we should get the OSG one looking, the VSG one looking like this. Um, this renders actually pretty quick. The OSG you're in about two and a half thousand hertz, um, but with the VSG it runs about three times quicker. Um, it runs so well in the Open Scene Graph because there's basically nothing there. There's just a few textures and a few, um, you know, some very simple meshes. Um, yeah, with the with the Vulcan scene graph tends to be much faster the more complicated the scene you have. So the more CPU limited you are, then um, 
the, the greater the, the benefit there is of using the Vulcan Zingroff um, because the traversals are much faster and the um, submission and rendering in Vulcan is just so much faster. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, I've seen a lot of projects like talk about, oh, we ported to Vulcan, to Vulcan and then get like, oh, we've got 10% performance improvement, 20% performance improvement. And I have been seeing between three times to 20 times performance improvement. Um, compared to urban scene graph applications. Um, now, there's some applications, if you're fill limited, you'll just get like no performance benefit. Um, but if you're CPU limited, that's when Vulcan and Vulcan scene graph will really shine. And you can see you know, huge differences in performance. Okay, I think I've said mostly what I want to say. Um, Yeah, um, so the next, I don't really have any roadmap for um, beyond 1.0. Um, I broadly would like to rewrite the ray tracing and the mesh shaders. So the mesh shaders are currently based on the NVIDIA extensions. I would like to rewrite those into Kronos mesh shaders. I'd like to rewrite the ray tracing stuff so it's a bit more like more than the rest of the VSG. So um, the ray tracing stuff was written, written back in 2019 uh, by Tom, Thomas Hogarth, and the VSG was still evolving at that point. Whereas now the VSGs, a lot of the question marks about how to do the API and how to store data and how to transfer data, that's kind of been settled mostly um, in the Vulcan scene graph. Um, so if you were to implement those extensions now, you could do it more cleanly. Um, so I'd like to have a look at those and just kind of go at them first principles. Um, same with the mesh shaders. Um, I would also like to look at um, the compile traversal. The, the VSG is currently slower than I'd like. Um, when transferring data to the G, uh, to uh, the transfer buffer before it gets transferred to the GPU, um, currently the VSG for every single object is uh, mapping and unmapping that data before it's transferred to the, the staging buffer. And it turns out the map and unmap is really expensive. Um, and when I implemented the transfer data class, um, originally I had it with a map and unmap, but when I disabled the map and unmap, I got like a 40% improvement in performance, transfer performance. So it's a huge overhead. Um, so we potentially can get compile traversals faster. Um, by just as simple as that. And so I was thinking about trying to combine the compile traversal copy of data with the transfer data class and you know, have basically a dedicated transfer data class that can handle not just the dynamic updates to the scene graph as it does right now, but also transferring data uh, via the transfer buffer to the GPU. Um, and so that'd be one of the upgrades. So that'd be a kind of a VSG 1.2 thing we'll be aiming for. So things like mesh shaders, ray tracing update, and making the compile traversal more efficient. Um, there's also potentially more extensions you might want to implement and more um, shader features that you might want to add like shadows um, and environment maps. You might want to add to the, uh, the PPR shaders um, and kind of convenience things like billboards. Um, so now we've got billboarded text um, but we don't yet have um, billboarding built into the PBR and the, the Fong shaders. So that would be another thing to kind of look at. Um, potentially character animation in the shaders as well. Um, we don't get too many things in the shaders, but just enough for you know, a larger percentage of the application developers to be able to just use things out of the box rather than having to write their own stuff. Um, okay. I hope that makes sense. That's but um, also the kind of feature roadmap will depend on um, what the community want and what my clients want. And so if you see a feature that's missing within the Vulcan scene graph um, and you'd like to see it then, then and talk to me, you know, uh, a few chunk, quite a few chunks, probably about a third of the Vulcan scene graph was paid for by clients um, in terms of the time put into it. Um, and then the rest has been me using the funding I brought in from client work to basically just go off and write the rest of the scene graph. Um, 
and that's the kind of model I've worked for the last 20 years um, with open scene graph and the Vulcan scene graph, so I kind of expect that to continue. Um, the On the open scene graph side, I think there's much more work to be done on making a better mapping between the open scene graph and the Vulcan scene graph and making it so that it's, it's got all the features that you want to use. Um, as um, Tim has mentioned, you, there's a number of those already and you can map them quite efficiently, but it'd be nice to do that, you know, resolve even more of those kind of how you glue the two together issues. Um, now, it would be nice if you know, a company is going to be doing all that work to, to help fund me or other engineers um, to help that do that. Um, and th so I think that would be a you know, big area for future development to make sure that OSG to VSG is really solid um, and potentially start cherry picking the really good features from the Vulcan Sync Graph that can be backported to the Open Sync Graph would be another interesting thing to look at. And then there's a, there's a whole suite of different you know add-on libraries that you can add on to the open sync to the Vulcan scene graphs um, to do different features like animation libraries, physics integration with Python, or Lua, and um, you know you can come up with a huge long laundry list of um, features that people want. Um, for the core scene graph, I you know it's I think it's pretty pretty decent already. Um, so you know certainly good enough for people to start playing with. I'm pushing ahead. I mean, some people have been playing with it for three years, even when it wasn't quite ready to play with. So that's the way products work. And as I said, products need that. You know, you by testing software with real world applications is when you find out the problems in them and then you can resolve them. And that's how I'd like to continue with the Vulcan Scene Graph. All right, I'm going to wrap up now, unless anybody wants to present anything or ask any more questions. Is there anything else? All right, I will say good night to you all. Good midday, <laughs> if you're up in the States. All right, um, well, thanks oh, to all. Thanks a lot, Robert. That's great, okay. Um, thanks to all the contributors um, over the last four and a half years. It's really made a, a big difference to the project. And the funders as well, they, they, you know, without them, they, we, we wouldn't have this project to play with. All right. Thanks, Robert. Um, Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, we've got a dog there. <laughs> yeah, my dog's not in here. All right, I'll say goodnight, everybody. <laughs>